Thank you, Brother Larry, Brother Pat. I rejoice to be one that declares to you the works of God and of our Lord Jesus Christ. There was a time prior to King David when King Saul was king over Israel that Jonathan, his son, and his armor bearer embarked on an endeavor. Jonathan, remember, he said to the young man, he said, come and let us go and discover ourselves to these others. He's uncircumcised. The armor bearer replied, do all that is in thine heart. He said, turn thee. Behold, I am with thee according to thy heart. This is my desire and our desire as we minister to one another. We want to do all that we see that the Lord Jesus is doing. We want to be a part of his work. The new and living way was opened unto us, as Brother Pat has just declared, by the Lord Jesus, particularly in his death, and then, of course, in his resurrection. In that, so many things were done. And mine, my, my narrow uh, margin of that is that he destroyed him that had the power of death, that is the devil. Notice he had to clarify that. That is the devil. See, actually, it's, it's God that has the power over the issues of life and death, but there's a particular death that he's talking about here, and we'll open that up. But I'm going to go just a little bit further because this is not the end of the phrase or the, or the thought even. It says, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. This is like a continuous move. It's, it's all in one direction. He died. He died. Uh, destroyed him, the devil, and then he delivered them that were in danger or through fear of death were all subject to bondage. Now in the book of Hebrews, this epistle is a ministration or a revelation of better things. The whole thing is that way. It testifies of the removal of lesser things. Why? So that better can be brought in. But they're brought in, all of them, as we read through or, or as we minister to one another in the book of Hebrews, all these things are brought in in Jesus himself. In his administration of salvation to men. Less, the reason is because lesser things have a tendency to hold back, to hinder the arrival and the establishment of better things. So they have to be set aside. And in the case of our text, a crippling power of influence is effectively dealt with by Jesus. The, the devil had the power of death. Now, what, that's a pretty, pretty big power. Yeah. Again, now that was not of himself. That was granted for God's purpose. Amen. Jesus dealt with this in the same stroke or in the same circumstance, we're talking about his death, that will ultimately usher in a lasting peace between God and men. So see, all this was dealt with by Jesus in the one move in his death. Amen. Jesus' death is actually a very militant maneuver. The Lord is a man of war. Amen. Jesus goes forth conquering and to conquer. Remember, remember from the Psalms, he's, he is the strong man that rejoices to run the race. This is like the final lap. The strong man rejoicing, the what he's going to do, the great enemy of God's people, the devil, is going to be dealt the blow that declares that his final doom is sure. Amen. In this accomplishing death, there would be at once or simultaneously happening a bottleneck of the devil's works, a releasing from captivity, those under his dominion, into a liberty, and a launch of the promised initiative of the new man. Hmm. Now, remember this was prophesied way back. The seed's heel was bruised in that, in that forceful crushing of the serpent's head. See, the contact was one. The head was, brushed, was uh, crushed by the heel that was bruised. Bruises cause long-lasting discomfort, pain, but crushing is deadly and permanent. I want to talk about this in a little more detail. In the promise in Genesis 3.15 to the serpent, the first thing mentioned was the bruised head spoke first to the serpent of what would happen to him. Now see, the, the head of the serpent is his point of contact with mankind. He speaks from his mouth. The bruised head then prophesies of the destruction of Satan's power. He's crafty. He's subtle. All those things resonant in the mind of this vile creature would be exposed when his head is crushed. See, this is what's given to God's people to see. We're able to be 
Uh, we, we are not unaware of his devices. We're not ignorant of them. From the mouth in that head also had come the first words to mankind that denigrated and questioned the wisdom and kindness of their creator. That same mouth continued to lie, continued to accuse the brethren unto God. So the bruising of that head under the saints' feet, shortly, is related to their knowledge of his wicked devices and the circumvention of them in the attainment of the salvation of their souls. See, as the, Jesus actually continues to crush the head of the serpent by us knowing about his devices and about us knowing how the new man lives and expands and flourishes. On the other hand, the bruised head of the seed of the woman, the bruised heel, I'm sorry, signifies the affectation of mobility, the heel, that on which you walk and get about, seemingly anyway. He appeared to have been stopped, Jesus did, in his forward progress. Well, the disciples wondered, where was he for three days, see? But the bruising of the, from the serpent was unto the nature of Jesus that was identified with men, as is written in our text. The flesh and blood partakement. That's what the serpent bruised. The robe of a body, even though it was an especially prepared one. The bruising that took place at the level of payment for sin was inflicted by God. See, the devil can only go so far in his bruising. Just like in the limitation of Job, this far and no more. The devil wasn't bruising Jesus for sin, nor could he, but the father had access to cause the travail of his son's soul unto his righteous satisfaction. So the devil bruises when he does out of wrath and hatred. That's even how he works on the sons of God. His signature marks are anger and hatred and lying and deceit. But God bruises out of a just nature and unto the revelation of his merciful purpose. The chastisement of our peace, or that brought us peace, was upon him. Now, if I were to outline uh, verses 14 and 15 or, or give the three main headings, we would see that Jesus died, which is a miraculous accomplishment in itself. Amen. Jesus destroyed the devil, and Jesus delivered, and then it's very particular in the following verse. He delivered the seed of Abraham. We'll talk about that a little bit, too. As Jesus died as the Son of God that was made the Son of Man. Through this medium or through this action were accompanied, was accomplished diverse effects. In other words, there was a, an, it was not just a local effect felt there. There's a man on a cross in the end of it. See, this, this affected men. This affected angels. This affected God. This affected everything that had to do with the things, with the beings that God had made in his relation to them. Amen. The just angels and the unholy angels alike. Secondly, Jesus destroyed the devil. Now, he destroyed him. See, it didn't say he killed him or set him aside. This was designed to have the greatest impact. He didn't just remove him. What this did was this affected this existence of the power of death to those who were able to understand how that previously worked on them. Now they've been freed from that dominion, that power of death over them. And then Jesus delivered the seed of Abraham. This was like the fruitage of the work. He delivered them. And this is the part that we talk about, the things that Jesus accomplished on our behalf. We've been delivered. So the work of God in Christ had to be and was, it had to be arranged and carried out progressively in this particular order. Even though these things are all happening together, as it were, there is a direction to them. In other words, one is built upon the other. Progressively speaking, his death as a destruction of the devil and his works opening the way for the ensuing deliverance of the previously bound people. Now, these people were not bound by where they lived, by who they were necessarily, not by physical limitations of the earth. They were, nor were they even really bound by the bars of unbelief. Many prior to Christ's death had indeed lived and died in faith. We know those, our brethren of the old covenant. Rather, these captives were limited within a dominion enforced by the prince of this world. It was a setting that was changed and, and broken and surpassed when Jesus died and rose again, see, by, his own, by God's own design in the fullness of time. 
This was a bondage notorious for a fear of death. That, that fear of death held sway for a long time before the putting away of sin, and then included a perceived distance from God. Now, there were those that could draw near to God to the degree that they understood and that God opened up to them. But this new and living way was not yet opened until Jesus died. So let's go through the three points more in particular. Number one, to die. Jesus died. How did Jesus die? What did it take for the Son of God to die? How much did he die? What did this involve? Well, first of all, he had a prepared body. Lo, I come. God prepared him a body. It was prepared by God. Why was that? Well, God knew alone what would be suitable for the bearing of sin. He prepared Jesus a body particularly for that. He was God's lamb. Jesus came into the world as born. He didn't come in as created like Adam did. Adam was created in, in full physical maturity of age. This being born would presumably be a disadvantage. You see, you would, you would think that he would be born, he would be subject to greater possibility of error or danger as he grew. But God rather suited this to his advantage. What he was doing was he was giving long occasion to full identification of Jesus with the partakers of flesh and blood. He, he grew up. This period, enveloped in time, would allow a thorough scrutiny by all interested onlookers. As God kept up his lamb, in preparation for the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Some missed it, see, not all. No accusation would be able to stand that presumed a blemish upon this particular one of God's choosing. Not only did he have a prepared body, but that body as he, as he grew and as he fulfilled his years in the flesh was, a, was that of a tested and tried man. Now this is ultimately, see initially, Jesus' initial identity with men was that of a physical nature. In other words, it, like in verse 14, it talks about a partaker of flesh and blood. But you see a progression even in the text. By the time he gets into verse uh, 14, 15, and 16, now he's talking about this ultimate identity in salvation with the seed of Abraham. So he's very particular about this. His, Jesus' spiritual nature was not identified with man because man is dead in trespasses and sins. This was subsequent to Adam's departure through sin and it's evidenced even in the overshadowing of Jesus by the Holy Ghost of Mary. Or I, I'm, I'm sorry, not of Jesus, but of Mary by the Holy Ghost when she was told that that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Now Jesus grew up, the involvements of life would encompass him but would not include the advent of death, naturally speaking. Mm -hmm. Death is the result of sin. And so death passed upon all men for that all of sin. That's why he said, I give up my life. Right. The sons of Adam have an appointment with death. And after this, the judgment. Jesus had no such appointment. He did, though, have a separately determined and formerly intended appointment of death actually from before the very foundation of the world. Now here, here's how the Bible describes his appointment with death. He said himself, I lay my life down and I take it up again. He would give his life a ransom for many. His death would not be for his own sin, but for the sins of the people. He would be delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. He would die unto sin once, but live unto God. He was delivered for our offenses and raised again for our justification. He was put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Now see, this was a unique and only the only death like this. By, by the only accomplishing death among men, even though it was punitive in its reception, in other words, he was dying and being punished for sins, all the results of that death would be proactive. And that's where we come to our text. In, that, in some of those results of that death, he's going to destroy the devil and deliver those, the seed of Abraham. Not only did he have a prepared body, and he was demonstrated to be tested and tried and, and brought up by God, but he was declaring in his death a finished work. 
time of culmination or a time of closure. Now I'm talking about, it, it wasn't that he ceased to work, but he ceased to work in the days of his flesh at his death. He finished the work that God gave him to do. He said, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. He said again, the works which the Father hath given me to finish, the same works that I do, bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. Now certainly he was talking about his miraculous works and his ministry to the disciples, but he was also talking about that great work to, when he set his face toward Jerusalem. Amen. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do, as he prayed. And finally, it is finished. So there, the works, or the work, either one, both, in that body were finished. You think of the works, you can think of we now as his workmanship. He continues to work. He continues to dispense the things that the, that the seed of Abraham need, but he's working from a, a different position now. He was made after the power of an endless life. And he ever liveth now to make intercession for us. So you see, his works never, never he, he never started working, as it were, and he never finished working. His works, you think, if you look backward, you see his works portrayed in the creation of the worlds, by whom he made the worlds. If you look in the days of his flesh, the Son was the one that was making known the Father. That was his work, to, to testify of the Father. And now we see him as the King of glory. See, he's, he's busy about a work of his securing eternal redemption for men. Now, uh, lastly, and I think this is... Uh, this, this draws the others together. He died as the corn of wheat. He said, except a corn of wheat fall, in other words, there's going to be fruit brought forth. This is what he is talking about. Except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. Now we know that his death was not small and insignificant and, and related only to something he had to accomplish for himself or for a select group. See this, he says, but if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. This is the desire of God. Some of the portions of the fruit, now this is from John 12, and if you look, even in that very context, he's just beginning to display some of that fruit, and he hasn't even actually, physically speaking, passed into death yet. Some of the fruit even mentioned at that time, he talked about the Son of Man being glorified. He talked about the Father also being glorified. He spoke of the Prince of this world being cast out, as he looked forward and judged or destroyed from our text. And he talked about men being drawn to Jesus, not as gazers or onlookers, but to participate in what he was doing. Now on earth, if you speak about death, people draw back. See, it generally speaks of life ceasing, progress ceasing, that's it. For Christ, however, in his accomplishing death, it actually opened up new vistas. Life, immortal realities sprang forth that men had not known of before. The unique prospect, or actually the sure promise of life springing forth, would still bear the likeness of the bare grain. But it would exponentially multiply the display of that grain's nature. See, that's where we come in. That's, what he, that's where we are. We're displaying his nature. We shall also bear the image of the heavenly. And we shall be as the stars of the heavens for multitude by his promise. The death of Jesus in also evidenced a break with former things. Prior to that, or up and, up and through that point, see, he was dealing with the sins of the world. Remember, he's going to come a second time, but he's not going to deal with sins. Yeah. He was at that point, though, the death of Jesus was the time of, 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 break, of coming into some of the new and living way, but he was going to bear the sins of many then. He was taking on the form of a servant, he humbled himself unto death, yea, the death of the cross. He was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. At that point, he was despised and rejected of men. He was a man of sorrows. He was acquainted with grief, stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. He was wounded, bruised, chastised, and oppressed. See, all these things came upon him in his death. But there, that was the last time they would come upon him. See? Yeah. Corresponding with all these sufferings, there were exact and sure glories to follow as covenant between, covenanted between him and the Father. Upon the Father's pleasure and satisfaction at his death, a new generation would now be brought forth. 
See, Jesus is the, he's the only man that had to travail unto death in childbirth. And in doing so, he brought many sons unto glory. He died to destroy. He destroyed him that had the power of death. Now we're speaking of the devil. In what way did he destroy him? To what degree did he destroy him? What, what does that, what does that accomplish for us, for me, for you, for the sons of Abra the seed of Abraham? Now we must acknowledge this is not apparent to the naked eye of flesh. To the world at large, his craft and power are still great, and he still rules with cruel hate. The destruction then was not physical, or even really a spiritual death, for the devil yet retains power and authority in this present evil world. He's the, he's the god of this world. He roams about, seeking ones to devour. But the destruction of the devil is seen and acknowledged in the same manner as we know the other things about Jesus that he accomplished in his death and resurrection. In other words, it's seen by faith. And so it's only really seen by particular people, those that have faith. The seed of Abraham. See, that? see where he's going? The removal of the sin of the world as a condemnation enabled enlightenment now to believing men in regard to their position as now they're related to God. The devil, the holy angels, the unholy angels, and the spirits of departed or dead men. See, all these relationships were seen in a new way. Now that Jesus has died... Destroying the devil opened these things up. Now their position, those that believe, is higher. They can see more. They are seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. They have an ability, and not just an ability, but a desire to discern God's holy purposes. God's holy purpose includes men and angels' destiny. So what was or what is the extent of the devil's power? Well, principalities and powers, the angels, the unholy angels here, and particularly their leader, the devil, have no correlation to physical death as we know it. See, it's appointed unto men once to die physically. It is man's greatest fear, but their nemesis is a loss of power or might. See, these are what these powers of, uh, this is what the devil would fear. Their ability to influence or to cause an effect or to negotiate, to move around in their chosen domain. See, some chose to remain in heaven, others went with Satan. We see this in, in several cases. Uh, the ones that I had thought of were like when the demons were cast out of the man at Gadara. See, they desired that they would not yet be put out of commission. They wanted to go somewhere else. And in the time of the kings in the Old Covenant, there were lying spirits that flourished even in the very mouths of the prophets. But see, they wanted to be active. They wanted, they wanted to be... Uh, engaging with men and causing things to take place regarding the truth or regarding error. Men glory in riches and wisdom and strength, but the devil lifted up himself against God, proclaiming, I will be like the Most High. So his greatest shame then would be to be exposed as unlike the Most High. That's what Jesus' death does. See, it exposes the devil. He's been denied this masquerade as an angel of light. He still continues it, but to those who see him as he is, the power has been cut off from it. Amen. Now, Jesus' death, physically speaking, was the point of demarcation for all of the effects about which we're talking, all of the effects that brought about the truncation of the devil's usurped power. See, God allowed this, and God... With, with him bringing sin into the world, he did have a real power among mankind, a very effective power. But the devil has no intrinsic or of his own self power over the deaths of men. This is God's power. It is according to his wisdom and purpose. In Job's case, God set boundaries. The power of death that we're speaking about here in the text then pertains to this matter of bringing men to death by them sinning. See, that's what the devil's involved in. The initial incidence was sin entered the world and death by sin. So you see, that's how the devil works. He works like back, he, he works from the side in a, in a tricky way as he is known for. Satan imported death with a lie. 
The primary death that was imposed at the crossroads of Eden and eternity was spiritual in nature. See, man died, first of all, he, he didn't drop on the ground there, but he died unto God. He was alienated from the life in God. Amen. He was relegated to servitude to an infinitely lesser master, the prince of this world, rather than his creator. So that's the death, the power of death that the devil holds that Jesus was going to destroy. Jesus was in the perfect position to destroy the devil. He was placed there by God's foreknowledge and wisdom, and he, and he was prepared in his body to have that exact effect, that in his death he would destroy the devil. Satan was a real power. He, up to that point, had overcome all contenders from the race of men. Not only had they all physically died, but all that had departed in Adam, for as in Adam all die, were slain by him that had the power of death. That's what brought them to that death unto God. Now, though, a flesh and blood man had never succumbed to temptation unto sin, thereby earning the wages of death. In a rage of the combined forces of the powers of darkness and the hands of wicked men, the devil incited the crucifixion of the prince of life. He actually, what, this is, a, this is someone I was talking to yesterday talked about how Goliath was slain with his own sword. So this, was like a, this was like a picture of this. What, what happened was the devil actually unlocked the door of his house of death. He allowed Jesus access to his goods. Jesus entered, but he didn't stay because God raised him up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. But in the interim period, the strong man was bound in his own house, his house was plundered, and Jesus left with the keys of death and hell. That's good. <laughs> Jesus' death had no observable or, or magical effect if you viewed it strictly from an earthly vantage point. See, there were many people standing there that saw him die and then went their way. His death certainly disturbed even the very regions of the of its visible occurrence. The, the ground shook, the great earthquake. For three hours, darkness prevailed. There were those that came out of their tombs. So around Jerusalem, there was a physical impact at that point. But the epicenter of his death was in heaven. That's where the impact of sin's just payment was first felt. Amen. It brought about a dynamic change there. It brought about a change in God's relation now to mankind. So now he could receive them in his son. It altered permanently a world-based dominion of sin and death. So the effect primarily was in heaven, but it reached out. The, 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 uh, what is it that the earthquake causes? The tremblings reached out to touch the earth. Another key aspect of the destruction of the devil is the consideration of the plundering of his house. Now, the contention of the devil on earth is not really in direct conflict with God, at least not initially. He didn't go down to earth to, war, to, to raise an army, as it were, and fight God. So he went down to interrupt his work that he had done. He sought to destroy or to ruin God's work, man. And in doing so, he wanted to cause an ineffectuality and an incongruity in God's purpose. So the devil came down to the earth. He set up his own shop. He converted the original work of God and called it his own. Man, as made in God's likeness and image, most clearly resembled his maker, but now, after his fall by sin, he was disfigured, and he bore a similarity to the devil, who claimed and stamped him, sinned, short of the glory of God. See? The devil has no eternal purpose, though. He seeks to undermine and distort God's good work. He traffics in things like this. He blinds minds. He beguiles souls, he corrupts thoughts, he damns men. His level of activity and power is in that of deception. He is one that obscures, he shifts things. He blurs things, he replaces the truth. He employs wiles, he shoots flaming darts. He supplies signs and lying wonders to unstable souls. See all his works, you can see by their nature they're in opposition to God's works. God, God through Jesus, is... His work is to open things up and to clarify, to make things more known. So all his works oppose God, and they consist of a temporary and fleeting enticement, but it's always unto a destructive end. That's how it's known. 
But Jesus, here's what happened when he destroyed the devil. He destroyed him in that capacity to maintain this flourishing business in men as his own evil works. And in doing so, he delivered those same men. Now this, you'll, you'll remember in uh, 1 John, I believe it's chapter 3, he labels the devil's work like this. He says, he that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. So the destruction of the devil by Jesus is actually most seen or evident in the destruction of the devil's works. The devil has an output, a work. His production, the test, what this does, it testifies of his wicked nature and his profession. For this purpose, this is the second part of the verse, this is the gospel of the verse. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. If you go a little further on down, verse 9 declares how this is accomplished. And so we connect this with Jesus' death as the necessary contingency. In other words, the devil's work converted to God's work. Jesus' death was what brought that in. What's, whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. So you have ones that are known by their sin. Now you have ones that are born of God. Now they, that, that new man does not sin. For his seed remaineth in him. And he cannot sin because he is born of God. So in the new man in Christ Jesus, the devil and his works are emasculated. They're stripped. They're incapacitated. Amen. They're rendered ineffective as far as to their former state. Now the works are the lives of men, mankind. But now the new birth directs these same men so that their activity and their intentions are Godward. They're unto righteousness. The destruction of the devil by Jesus is frustrating this work that he formerly intended and carried out by redeeming men from their iniquity and imputing the righteousness of God unto them in Christ Jesus. So this power of death that the devil has is traced back to enticing men through lust. You'll remember from the book of James how he speaks of this. The devil doesn't force men to sin. The devil didn't make them do it. See? He tempts them to do it. James says this, he surveys like steps leading to sin and death. And he goes through this. Every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Now, uh, again, lust may be morally neutral at that point. But see, not, not when he's drawn away. Not when, he, when he's enticed by the devil to direct it in a way that's not honoring to God or God's timetable or however God would intend it to be. So there's an there's a enticement to misuse that which God has given. So the devil's power of death engages right there at that enticing stage. See, if he's got you there and it continues, death is the end result. And that's what James talks about. When lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. That's the power of death that the devil has. The devil's power of death is going to fit in right there. Now, the devil did tempt Jesus... Didn't do it to aggravate him, but to cause him to sin. See, now if he, if he would have caused him through enticement to sin, then death would have been his due also in the same way. He, he tempted Jesus to act out of his own personal desire. To presume to impose his own will over or before the will of his father. The level of temptation is always consistent with the outcome at stake. In other words, he had the highest outcome at stake. This is, this is God's lamb. There's a great risk of loss if he sins. So the level of temptation was at the highest. That's why, this, that's why the scripture tells us that he was tempted in all points. It's very comprehensive as we are, but it clarifies it yet without sin. See? Yeah. Amen. The old man is ever ready to be drawn away into this situation where the outcome of enticed lust is sin followed by death. However, when he destroyed him that had the power of death, that is the devil, he undercut this because the new man does not operate in this manner. The work of Jesus in the new man is not obligated, nor even inclined to partner with lust, nor to succumb to fleshly enticement. So what this does, see, it cuts short the devil's intended work, and it tends unto life. And deliver them. Let me
me read the following verses. I don't think I read those before. I'll start with 14. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood. Now he's coming down through the text and he's talking about, Behold, I and the children whom God hath given me. In other words, God's, God's uh, rejoicing that his son has brought all these ones with him. I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the church while I sing praise unto thee. Behold, I and the children which God hath given me. And then he says, For as much then as these same children are partakers of flesh and blood, they're men, cre created men, he, Jesus, also himself took part of the same as a man, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For verily, for truly, he, that's Jesus, took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. In other words, he assumed upon himself the responsibility and the work that it would take to save them. He didn't assume the, anything to save angels. They were cast down. But he did assume that he was going to take on the nature of mankind and they would be saved. So to deliver those of Abraham's seed. It didn't mean that Jesus did not not become an angel. Rather, he extended and evidenced help and favor and deliverance to the race of men. Not just any man were recipients. There is an attraction and disposition toward Jesus' favor demonstrated in faith. Now, he died for the sins of the world, but those who respond in faith are the ones that receive this help, receive this favor. See, that's why he's very, that's why, that's why the shift where he talks about those of Abraham's seed, he didn't, you notice he didn't say Adam's seed? How else would we know? The point being made is not really his timing or the, or the schedule of this circumstance, but its compatibility and its effectuality. He's talking about that he can do it and he will do it. He's going to deliver them. Abraham's seed are those living by faith. And you know what? Jesus' help is uniquely suited to those ones. So the help is not physical primarily, although Jesus does help us in, in physical and external ways nor is his help confined to rescue from a hard situation. The testing of your faith is a very hard situation. But his suffering, Jesus' suffering, like his brethren, was limited by time. The days of his flesh were his limitation. Our years are according to his knowledge. It's related, though, the suffering is related in a large part to the conflict brought on by the situation of temporary testing. So he's testing our faith. Who are the seed of Abraham? Why, 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 Abraham? why did he use the seed of Abraham? Adam is a representative of weakness. Adam re represents the flesh without divine intervention prior to God working salvation. God's promise is linked to the seed of the woman in Genesis 3. He traces the, the humanity of Christ. He traces the Holy Ghost overshadowing of Mary to flesh and blood. But when he starts talking about those who live by faith, he goes further down the line and he picks up with Abraham. Now, there were others mentioned. If you go to Hebrews 11, he mentions at least three, Abel, Abel, Enoch, and Noah. They're noted for their faith also. But Abraham was different. He was chosen and called out by God to demonstrate in his life a particular aspect of that faith because he promised a seed to him. To him and to his seed is the tracing of of the divinity of the Christ, namely, an unwavering faith in his God. This is, this is what Jesus evidenced, an unwavering faith in his Father. Abraham journeyed through years and miles of life here. Now, Abel had a testimony of his speaking blood. He pleased God in death. Enoch had a testimony of a life pleasing to God, and God took him. Noah had a testimony of grace operating within the context of a coming judgment for all those years as he built the ark. See, all these ones, if you read down through there, they're declared righteous, righteous, righteous. Abraham is also declared righteous because he believed God. This was a result of their faith, and it was pinpointed most definitely 
or definitively rather in Abraham. He believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. Abraham pictured a barrenness, he and his wife Sarah, that according to Earth's capability had no resolution. God had made a promise, no seed. Years passed by. All the blessing coming from heaven to earth would be according, though, to this promise made by God, even though nothing had shown up. He believed. He continued to believe God. In Abraham's seed after the flesh, that's Israel, and Abraham's seed after the spirit, which is Christ's church, both of these evidence the, the panoply of God's works. And he's not done with either. He's working with both. Abel had died. Enoch had been translated. Noah had repopulated a dead and, and flooded earth. But Abraham was promised that his descendants, as many as the stars, would spring from one and him as good as dead. See, so he uniquely pictured Christ, who was cut off out of his generation. Abraham most effectively in his faith prefigured the promised seed, Christ. So that's why he talks about the seed of Abraham. His seed sprang from one considered dead, but enabled to be empowered by God to bring forth life that would be innumerable as the sand on the seashore. So you see that as Christ in his death, there was an identity with men, flesh and blood, in regard to their sin, which he bore. He bore the sin of the world. He bore the sin of men in Adam in his body on the tree. So that's why it says, while we were yet sinners. But his identity with Abraham's seed is in regard to their salvation. Now the just shall live by his faith. And so we are now justified by his blood, saved from wrath through him. So you see the shift in verse 14 to verse 16, the seed of Abraham. So the ministry of the text is Christ's identity with men in order to save them from sin. Not only from sin, but its power, its dominion, its penalty, and its main proponent, Satan, to deliver them and to destroy the devil. And to help them exemplify that salvation by a continuance in faith. So Jesus must identify with men in every area pertinent to this endeavor. And he did. It lays it out in several places there, even in the book of Hebrews. He must fulfill, Jesus must fulfill every obligation necessary to satisfy the just and holy God in his receiving of men that are now constituted as righteous. Nothing could be left out. Jesus was not lacking in any area of manhood that would disqualify him from bringing salvation to them. Neither was he deficient in possessing or demonstrating any qualities of the divine nature that would short circuit or weaken God's intervention or God's intention and purpose in him. Son of God, son of man, perfectly aligned and brought together. The things which he gave up in the incarnation, if you want to reference like in Philippians 2, the things that he gave up were not necessary or even a hindrance to perfecting God's will in the word made flesh. See, these, these would have actually hindered the work that he had to do. So he, he willingly gave them up. He thought it not robbery to be equal with God. But the things retained, though frequently veiled or hidden from some or even all men, were absolutely essential to complete the work he was given to do. He said, I only do those things which I see the Father do. So he must, Jesus must be God to save me. He must be man to bring me to God. So there is an identity with men in order to deliver them. To deliver them, the outcome. This deliverance has come forth out of Zion. This has come from, the, from God himself, from the heavenly regions. and It has come from the decree of the Lord God. Now, it didn't come forth as just a decree. It came forth as a man. He came, a deliverer comes forth out of Zion that will accomplish all of God's work. The devil was unacquainted with all of God's nature. His pride and arrogance actually cut him off from any further revelation of the sort that holy angels continue to look into. That's why he, as one of our brothers said, he continues to, to bang up, as it were, against the wall of God's purpose. He was unaware of the impact of the crushing that was due to come to him. But deliverance was enacted 
in the seed of the woman, Christ, and then it continues to be echoed and reenacted in all of his seed, in the expression of his people, his church, his bride. The corn of wheat continues to bear fruit. Psalm 22, and a seed, that's Jesus, shall serve him, God, and shall be accounted to the Lord for a generation. Except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die. It abides alone, but it died. He died, and he's bringing forth much fruit. He, God, shall see his, that's Jesus' seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Now, there's still a fear of death that lingers, as it were. See, we're not shut up to it. It still has the power to bring men into a lifetime subject to bondage. Doesn't mean you, ha- you are bond. See, if you, re- if you want to remain unaware of the, the ramifications of his death, you can, you can remain in that area and be subject to bondage. But Jesus has cleared that up. And so knowing what he has done and telling one another and, and rejoicing and dwelling in this encourages this matter of deliverance that he has brought about. A fear of death is appropriate for those who would continue in sin, for ones who who refuse and ignore deliverance. But the gospel is that the subjectivity to that fear of death, that condition existent under the dominion of the devil, is not a requirement to those of Abraham's seed. See, those that live by faith are not required to live under this fear of death. We desire to be taken on. As he, as he ministers. We desire to be taken on as Abraham's seed, as those for whom deliverance has been accomplished. And I close with this from uh, Isaiah, I believe, and also from Paul's writings. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? For if the Son shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Amen. Thank you. Amen.